Welcome, everyone, to the Sounds of Stories. Good evening, and welcome back to yet another episode brought to you by the Sounds of Stories. Tonight is our Murder Mystery Monday, and we're bringing to you the first of a two part series. Tonight's episode is called The Two Neighbors, and just as our first two episodes, it contains the illustrious crime detective Rick Bauer. And for those of you who haven't listened to the first two episodes, Rick Bauer is the Sounds of Stories version of a modern-day Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Puero. But before I give too much information to you and spoil the story, let's halt the needless chatter and jump right into The Two Neighbors. Written, narrated, edited, and produced by Bobby Garrison's The Sounds of Stories. The Two Neighbors 911, what's your emergency? I, uh, I believe my neighbor is dead. What's your location, sir? I'm at his house, um, 9247 West Peacock Drive. I'm sending an emergency unit out right now. I need you to stay on the phone with me, okay? Um, yeah, sure. What's your name, sir? My name is Peter Nichols. Okay, Peter, do you know the name of the person injured? Yeah, uh, his name is Brad Waltz. Are you in front of Brad right now? Yeah, yeah, he's right here in front of me. Can you describe the scene? Brad is uh, lying on his living room floor. He's lying on the ground, of course. He's, uh, he's been shot in the chest and forehead. Peter, do you know who shot him? I... I I shot him. Rick Bauer looked into the mirror while brushing his teeth. He noticed a small water spot in the lower left section of the mirror. The spot seemed to glare at Rick with rebellious demeanor. It was an intense stare-down. Rick could hear the gun duel song frequently played in the old spaghetti westerns. Rick grabbed onto his pajama sleeve like a six-shooter and wiped the mirror until the spot had disappeared. Not on my watch, Rick joked with his mouth full of fluoride. He finished his nightly proclivities and started to head to bed. He grabbed his TV remote off the nightstand and turned toward the TV to aim the remote when all of a sudden his phone rang. The last thing he wanted to do was answer it. He just arrived back at his home in Portland, Oregon less than three hours ago from his vacation near Little Rock, Arkansas. Rick spent a week fishing, relaxing, oh, and let's not forget also helping the police department down there solve a murder case. He looked down at his phone and saw that it was Lana Henderson, his supervisor. Never one to miss a call from her, Rick answered the phone. Lana! Rick greeted her. Hey, Rick, Lana said compassionately. I know you're probably jet-lagged getting back home, but we need you over here. Lana then informed Rick of a man who had called the police to confess a murder that the man committed earlier in the evening. Rick then listened to the 911 recording Lana had played for him. He heard Peter Nichols tell the emergency operator that he had shot and killed his neighbor, Brad Waltz. Rick could sense Lana was uneasy about the case, and he knew why. Rick then complied with Lana's request in investigating the scene. After the two of them hung up, Rick got dressed and headed to the house on Peacock Drive. When he arrived there, he was greeted by two uniformed officers, and they led him into the living room. Rick saw Brad's body lying on the ground in the middle of the room. He saw a pool of blood laying around the head and body of the victim drying onto the hardwood. And after looking all around the room, he looked through an opening between the family room and the dining room, and he could see Peter sitting on a chair at the dining room table. Since the start of the investigation, the back door remained open since that's how the crime scene was discovered, and a few windows were also open. Even though it was early spring, the night brought a chill to it that almost felt like winter. This could have been his body getting reacquainted with the cold Portland weather. 
After all, Rick did just spend a week in one of the warmest places in the Union. As Rick was looking Peter over, Rick noticed that his suspect wasn't wearing anything to keep warm. He had on only a t-shirt, shorts, and some tennis shoes. Peter hunched over on the chair, his right hand covering his left in front of his face, blowing the warm air from his mouth onto his hands. After visually surveying the area of the crime scene, Rick had somewhat of an instant epiphany about the murder committed earlier in the evening. He walked over to the security officers who stood on the other side of the back door. Rick knew one of the officers. His name was Mark Jules. Mark was a veteran officer on the force who spent his first 20 years of life on the East Coast before transferring to Oregon five years ago. Rick enjoyed Mark's company and always had a laugh with him. Gentlemen, how are we this evening? Oh, we're well, Detective Bauer, Mark answered. Then he asked Rick excitedly, How are you? How was your vacation in Arkansas? Well, it was a lot warmer than this tundra, Rick laughed. Oh, I bet. How was the fishing down there? Not as good as all the sleep I got in my boat. Yeah, I was about to say, Mr. Bauer, you're looking a little red in the face and neck. The men laughed for a second. Rick then glanced at his suspect, Peter, through his peripheral vision and noticed Peter looking at Rick and Mark laughing together. Peter wore a longing smile on his face as if to say that he should be there joking with the two men also. Rick got serious for a moment, turned his attention back to Mark and said, Sergeant Jules, something doesn't quite feel right about this one. Well, Rick, that's because it's a computer geek killing another computer geek. And it's in a computer geek neighborhood. If I'm to be completely honest with you, Rick, I've only dealt with a few of these cases and they never feel right. Yeah, that might be. But let me ask you a few questions about the crime scene anyways. If for nothing else, just to ease my conscience. Alrighty, let me have them, Rick, Mark said. First question. Were there any witnesses? Rick asked. None. Second. Describe the entry. Oh, that's not a question, Rick, Mark laughed. Oh, great attention to detail, Jules, Rick joined in with the laughter, then continued. Can you describe the entry? Oh, that's a little more like you, Rick. Let me see my report here. Let's see here, it says. Peter came in, forgot to close the door, walked up to Brad as he was watching the game on the tube, demanded the money Brad owed him for a gambling debt. When Brad said he wasn't going to pay him, Peter took out his gun from his back waistline with his right hand and shot him three times. Two in the chest and one in the head. What was the murder weapon? Rick continued to question without hesitation. It says, uh, Sig Sauer P365. A nine millimeter? Of course. Do we have any preliminary toxicology reports? We sure do, Rick, Mark answered. Mark pointed to his own nostril and said the word cocaine lightly. Rick was almost done with the questions and continued, All right, Jules, two more questions. Have you dusted for fingerprints? Of course we did, answered Mark. All over the inside and outside of the house. The only ones we found were on the murder weapon. And yes, they belonged to Peter. Have you gone over next door and looked through Peter's house? No, we might have if Peter was a suspect in hiding, but he's already confessed. All right, Mark, I appreciate your time. What do you say we go over to the bar tomorrow and watch a game? You got it, Rick. Before I go back in and talk to Peter, will you close the door now, Mark? Hey, that's one more question than you were allotted, Mark joked, then turned around, tried to close the door, but it wouldn't latch. You gotta lift the handle a little. A voice came from the other side of the room. It was Peter's voice. Rick took off his overcoat, walked over to Peter and placed it around him. We hope you're enjoying The Two Neighbors, a Sounds of Stories original. I wanted to ask each listener to follow or subscribe to the channel, and if the platform allows, please rate the channel five stars or give it a thumbs up. Thank you, and let's get back to the story. Peter... My name is Rick Bauer. I'm going to ask you a few questions. But first, can I have someone here get you some coffee or some cocoa? 
Rick asked Peter in the nicest good cop tone. No, thank you. In fact, if it were 30 minutes ago, I would have declined your coat. But it sure has gotten chilly in these last few moments. Peter was still shivering, but Rick thought that it might not just be from the cold. It seemed to Rick that Peter might still be in a little bit of shock. Very well. If you change your mind, though, let one of us know. Will do, Inspector. Oh, no, not Inspector, good sir. Just a lowly detective. My mistake. Well, Peter, it is your first mistake of the day. You're forgiven. Peter looked at Rick with horror in his eyes, as if his secret was somehow found out. What do you mean, first mistake? Peter finally asked. I killed my friend, didn't I? I don't know where you come from, but around here, that's a huge mistake. Rick looked at Peter unfazed. Then he asked Peter, If you could take back your murder of Brad, would you? Peter thought about it for just a quick moment, but then answered as if not wanting to sound too suspicious for taking too long to answer. Um, of course I would. That bastard owed me money. When I came to collect, he laughed in my face and told me that he was never going to pay me. How much did he owe you? Rick asked as if he were really puzzled. I don't know, like five grand? Peter answered emphatically. What was the last thing you said to your friend before you killed him? Uh, I'll kill you if you don't pay me right now. That's when he laughed, and after that I shot him. How about the second to last thing you said to him? I, I don't really remember, Peter answered. Well, I remember, and all I did was listen to my superior when she read to me the whole police report at the beginning. The reason why you can't remember is because you lied about this whole thing. Peter's eyes looked even more intense. Uh, why would I lie when I confess to killing my friend? There you go with that word again. Friend. How is he your friend when you would gladly kill him again for what? Owing you money? Well, it was, it was a lot of money, Peter said. Rick could start to sense fear in Peter's voice. Look, I have no doubt that Brad owed a lot of money, but it wasn't to you. I have no doubt that you were present during the murder. That's why you're still in a little bit of shock. But you weren't the one to murder Brad. Too many things are inconsistent with the way this murder pans out. Rick noticed that out of the six other people who were in the house with them, including guards, inspectors, and another detective, they were all gazing intently at Rick to see where he was going with his line of thought. I I don't get it, detective, Peter said. I called the police. I waited here. I confessed. What could be inconsistent with this? One, the level of the shakiness of your voice when talking to the 911 operator. A man who killed like that in cold blood for money is a psychopath. There is no shakiness in his voice. Two, you keep calling Brad a friend, but said that you would gladly kill him again if the situation were the same. Very inconsistent. Three, you have no gloves on, but there were no fingerprints on the door handle. There were only fingerprints on the weapon. What, did you open the door with your gun? Come on, Peter, who killed Brad? Look, I told you, detective, I... Don't interrupt me. Four, if you were going to murder Brad, you would have closed the door. You knew how to close the door. You gotta lift the handle a little is what you told my guard over there. So you knew how to close it, but I'm guessing the real killer didn't. That's why it was open the whole time. Five, I know you shot Brad in the chest twice, didn't you? But you shot him after he was already dead. The killer made you. He took the gun he shot Brad in the head with, placed it in your hand, and made you pull the trigger. Isn't that right? How on earth do you know that? Peter asked in disbelief. Six. You have blood all over your right arm, which means when you shot him, you shot him at close range, but I'm guessing that you shot him with your right hand. And when I saw you warming your hands a little while ago, your right hand was covering your left while you were blowing your hands to keep them warm. This means that you are left-handed, or left-hand dominant. So I'm going to ask you one more time, Peter. Who killed Brad Waltz? Peter immediately broke down and told Rick and everyone else in the room about a new local drug king who was in the neighborhood. 
The drug lord's name was Sonny Marks. Peter and Brad owed Sonny about $5,000 for cocaine over the last year, and Sonny made an example out of Brad that everyone needed to pay what they owed. Sonny then told Peter to call the cops and report that Peter himself killed Brad. Then, as Rick Bauer suggested, Sonny made Peter shoot Brad twice in the chest. Then Sonny threatened Peter that if he told the cops the truth, Sonny himself would kill Peter's wife and kid. Immediately after Peter's true confession, the cops covertly went into Peter's home in order to rescue Peter's family. They were found alive and unhurt. They were quietly brought into custody along with Peter, who would be dismissed of all charges if he would testify against this drug lord. Peter said he would cooperate, but Rick first needed to go out and find this Sonny Marks. We hope you've enjoyed spending your time with the Sounds of Stories, listening to part one of The Two Neighbors. Once again, please follow or subscribe to the channel and rate this story if the platform allows. That way the Sounds of Stories can be broadcasted to more people. Music and sounds done by Epidemic Sounds, and tonight's amazing musical contributors are Dream Cave as well as Nylonia. Come back soon for another episode.